So we now like to welcome Jesse Rush to the virtual stage. Jesse has been in the wireless industry since 2006 and has been CTO of BuySales Technologies for the last six years. Coming from rural Wisconsin, Jesse is very passionate about developing technical solutions, which help bridge the digital divide in rural America. He is also a strong believer in the merger of IT and telecom through decoupling technology like Open RAN and an advocate for open source platforms like Magma. Jesse will be sharing our first Magma user story, highlighting deployment of Magma at Y Connect. Welcome, Jesse. Welcome. Thanks for the intro. So I'll go ahead to get the screen shared here. All right, you guys seeing everything fine? Yep. Okay, great. So yeah, to start, um, actually, um, so the operator that we'll be uh, discussing here is actually an operator that uh, I used to work for before joining BuySells um, in Y Connect Wireless. So with Y Connect, uh, it's, you know, it started, uh, <laughs> this, the story is very similar actually to, to a number of WISPs in the US, which I believe is over about 2000 or so. Um, and uh, so Y Connect, uh, it was formed uh, via computer connections, just uh, an IT shop um, in rural part of Wisconsin, um, acting as a data center, providing IT support for a number of business customers. Um, and uh, of course, you know, being from uh, rural Wisconsin, there's very limited uh, internet options. Um, so you know, the, the story began where Y Connect got started, trying to connect uh, all of these uh, underconnected uh, communities, which at the time pretty much were down to dial up or satellite uh, as an internet option. Um, you know, for myself uh, with BuySells, uh, you know, BuySells uh, came to market about um, five years ago. And, uh, you know, we kind of had that belief that we could bring cellular technology to everyone, um, you know, using not just lower cost solutions, but at the time, um, and still to this day, we use what we have our, as our own cloud EPC. Now the cloud EPC does have certain limitations and this is where kind of Magma can kind of step up uh, to deliver a number of, of feature sets uh, uh, going forward that is something that could not be delivered uh, via the, the cloud EPC method. But um, we will uh, continue to try to be very high level focusing on the delivery of Magma for Y Connect and, and how that came about. So yeah, I, again with uh, uh, Y Connect. Uh, so one of the things uh, is uh, with the area of West particular in Wisconsin that we are covering, uh, it, it, it's very uh, it's difficult because it's the one area that we call the driftless area. And uh, there's lots of bluffs, hills, valleys it's not something simple where you could just, you know, build tall towers and cover a wide area. Um, you know, there's no line of sight in, in many cases going five miles and such. Uh, so th the way around this is really just building many sites. So um, at this point with Y Connect, they are covering over seven counties uh, with 232 sites. <laughs> the majority of those are going to be off of existing vertical assets, uh, being silos, grain elevators, and so forth. Um, now, because of the very sparse population um, in this region, uh, it is pretty common um, that there's gonna be some sites with a very low user count, um, sometimes as low as say five. Um, but yeah, many of these sites uh, you know, are, are quite rural and uh, you know, aren't gonna be expected to have a number of users. So uh, you know, the economics of delivering um, the wireless, uh, fixed wireless here is gonna be a big key. Um, and this is a, another area where, where Magma can support this activity. So just to recap kind of on what are the, the challenges here, uh, but what are also the benefits for bringing uh, cellular technology um, using that for fixed wireless. So um, not too long ago, LTE was, was really not an economical viable solution for you know, the majority of WIS. Um, you know, when you add the cost of the entire RAN solution plus uh, the core network, it you know it, it, it you know you couldn't even 
there was no bridge to even try to to enter to do trials to to really get there um so but again the you know one big benefit for us market we do now have uh speaking of, of uh, last year the the official launch of cbrs so that is brand new uh, band 48 spectrum that is uh truly available to pretty much everyone um so you know before the barrier was that there's it's all licensed bands um now prior to cbrs there was uh 50 megahertz uh of nn license uh, which it was in the 3.65 uh gigahertz range uh 237 so this 50 megahertz was pretty much what the operators were using uh up until the cbrs opened up uh, a total of 150 megahertz uh but at this point it's 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 even no longer uh just like a a play for actual operators um you know we're seeing so many use cases uh for this uh, private lt5g now um and you know from last year you know the biggest market we actually saw was uh, the education market where school districts were building out their own networks and trying to deliver internet connectivity to a number of low-income uh, areas um, and the campus itself. So um, it's no longer just uh, an operator play um, for whether it's fixed or mobile, but you know there's uh, many uh, use cases here. But um, you know when you're comparing to previously Wi-Fi and still to this day, Wi-Fi is pretty much still the, the main go-to uh for for fixed wireless but in, in comparison with lte um you do have advanced scheduling uh you know bare support for qs um you also have a much larger uh ue ecosystem um to select from with wi-fi it wasn't designed for uh fixed wireless per se or for long distance coverage so when you look at the vendors that are out there they add their own proprietary protocols kind of on top of that say uh, tdma for example um, and they pretty much vendor lock it in. So if you're gonna deploy Wi-Fi from one vendor, you, you don't have a choice. You're gonna buy the, the rest of the, the CPEs from them as well. Um, so, you know, there's that advantage. Uh, and then we see with CBRS, more and more uh, UEs are, you know, coming to market. So that in turn is also, you know, lowering the cost uh, as well. Um, so, and then of course, mobility is a, is something that uh, you know for for Wi-Fi there wasn't much standard around that, but um, mobility is uh, well for fixed wireless mobility might not seem to be as important, but it does provide um, more additional revenue stream potentials. So um, where previously you know maybe just fixed wireless bringing broadband to businesses and homes was uh, you know that might have been one of the only revenue streams. Well, you know now there's potentials uh, as we've seen. Um, other speakers talk about of potentially becoming your own MVNO, perhaps uh, maybe you aren't just selling CPEs anymore. You could be looking at selling uh, more nomadic devices, uh, say like MiFi and such. Um, so, so there is more potential around that. Um, but as we've seen, uh, there is quite the barrier. Um, you know, it is, you know, the RAN still is more pricey than the Wi-Fi access points. Um, but you know, the biggest barrier that we see, um, you know, it might not be cost anymore. There, there is quite a number of EPC vendors. Um, we have the open source projects like Magma. So a, a number of these costs are certainly going down. Um, so that barrier isn't as big as it used to be, uh, but complexity still is, <laughs> is the biggest uh, kind of barrier that we have been seeing. Um, where when we look at cellular technology, traditionally being an MNO play, uh, they will have, you know, a number of engineers on staff that you know have been kind of trained um, and even specialized on the RAN or the core network but uh, you know you know clearly there is more complexity involved um, with LTE uh, than there would be uh, with Wi-Fi so I'm um, trying to build up that comfort level for a number of operators that's kind of really key um, and the more automation that can take place uh, and get more to being a, a service oriented play um, you know, the, the, the further we get along there, that's going to, to make the deployments of, of these uh, smaller operators uh, much more attainable. Okay, so as far as, uh, you know, how this project came about, um, so um, basically uh, Freedom Phi uh, worked together with uh, Y-Connect uh, to start uh, basically the, a field trial here. 
Um, and Y-Connect is really uh, a pretty good operator to, to do this with. Um, you know, firstly, it's, <laughs> you know, they don't have a lot of per se technical staff. Um, uh, and, you know, they're pretty Wi-Fi entrenched and focused, but uh, they've had a few deployments with LTE, but never quite got that training or knowledge or comfort level to really, you know, go mass deploy. So they would essentially just put LTE in areas that they needed better coverage, um, especially in situations that were more non-line of sight. Um, but uh, you know, for a true build out to build that comfort level, you know, because when, whenever there were say challenge, you know, issues of troubleshooting, um, you know, you're kind of lost <laughs> as far as you know what could be the issue. So um, having the the Freedom Five team and you know work together with Y Connect that really helped you know build that comfort level, um, and by them really working together to set up these uh, access gateway. Uh, hardware uh, to provide to them and have it more plug and play. Um, there was, you know, there wasn't much uh, configuration necessary on the Y Connect part. So all they really had to do was simply install one of these gateways, go through a couple procedures, and uh, away they went. Um, and you know, from from that point, once once they're pretty comfortable with that process, uh, you know, they've been able to go, you know, ten plus sites, you know, fairly quickly. <laughs> but um, the main goals here were. One, we wanted the redundancy. Uh, one of the issues with the, the cloud EPC, uh, you, you know, of course, is that your control plane uh, is you're, you know, required to keep the DNO Bs and UEs up. And when that control plane is going across the internet uh, to, uh, in our case, it was Azure servers, um, you know, there, there could be any kind of disconnect, whether it's locally on the own network or the public network. Um, of course, it was susceptible to that. And add on top that, Generally, in a WISP type network, there's a lot of microwave backhauls, and you know during certain periods of high congestion, there could be high delay. So it, there could be some flapping with the S1s, and so by bringing that uh, access gateway and essentially the MME to the tower itself, uh, you know, really resolves that problem. Um, multiple APNs. That was another limitation. Uh, we only supported the default uh, single APN, um, and with, with the cloud EPC. So Magma, of course, uh, with the later versions here can support multiple APNs and be able to split that out to different VLANs as well, which we'll be talking about. Um, network bridging, that is <laughs> another key thing uh, for you know, migrating, say, from a Wi-Fi network um, you know, to a, an LTE network that usually has another gateway involved. Um, bridging is, isn't something that uh, was supported previously. Um, but obviously with Magma, that's been something that's been more seamless. So um, now you can just simply set uh, an, an APN to be bridged so that the DHCP, an external DHCP server can be assigning uh, the IP addresses, uh, which is what, what is generally desired in an ISP network. Um, and then a, a couple other things uh, to, we needed to maintain the OMC connectivity uh, by maintaining that connection, uh, one, it's required for CBRS now, um, since it's using domain proxy method. But the other is just, you know, each vendor, whether it's buy cells or anyone else, they're going to have their own EMS solution. Um, this is what's going to be handling the software updates, the managing and monitoring of the equipment. So we do want to maintain that connection. Uh, when Magma was first deployed, there were some issues there which were later resolved, but, um, you know, that was one key piece. And then in the case of Y Connect, they also have a more vendor ag agnostic uh, NMS. Uh, in their case, they're using Nagios. So they wanted to make sure that uh, you know, Nagios was able to maintain connectivity to, to monitor the equipment. And this is kind of a high level view of where we are at stages. Um, so essentially the first stage here was to simply set up one access gateway, one test CPE, make sure the connectivity, um, everything was set up and working well. Um, once we got that part working, uh, we did have to wait for a new Magma software update. I believe at the time was version 1.2. Uh, once 1.2 is released, uh, multiple APNs were finally supported. Layer 2 bridging was supported. Um, and uh, so that was really key to move things to adding some live subscribers on a live tower. Uh, at that point, um, the next stage was really to migrate all the existing sites uh, to Magma. 
Um, and once that was accomplished, we pretty much achieved all the main goals we were you know, set to, uh, to achieve. And after that have been um, you know, still in the prog progress of, but uh, have been actively installing a number of new sites uh, using uh, uh, Magma EPC uh, access gateway for, for each site. Okay, so the initial gaps when all this got started, um, again, one was uh, that there was only one SGI interface uh, supported um, on the Migma side. So this was again resolved in version 1.2. Um, after that was accomplished, uh, we are now able to add uh, multiple S SGIs uh, and be able to set a separate VLAN for each one. Uh, and then the next, of course, was bridging. Uh, so again, one, two, we got that working. So once those first two were really resolved, that's when you know the more mass deployments were, were started. Um, and then uh, the, the third here was when we initial started, we also couldn't access the Enode B. So pretty much there is no monitoring capability um, and we could not directly access the Enode B as well. So that became an issue as you know, a lot of the configuration of the ENOB um, and troubleshooting of the ENOB is done by directly accessing the ENOB web interface or SSH port. Uh, and in the case of the Megma's initial uh, design, um, that was all hidden behind a NAT. Uh, so we are able to get past that by adding some port forwarding rules um, and the new Megma software does allow for other setups as well. And then, OMC connectivity was a, another issue. Um, and there's a new function that got added uh, called external ENOB management that can be set for the radio when it's added to Magma. Um, but by doing that, it allows the, the forwarding of the TR69 packets. It, it won't do any hijacking of that. Okay, as far as the, the network build out here, um, this is uh, the equipment that was being used uh, for the Y Connect uh, LTE network. Um, on the RAN side, uh, was using the Bicell's uh, Fortress Q and Bicell's, uh, you know, Cat4 and Cat6 uh, CP uh, radios. Uh, for core network, uh, Megma provide, uh, the Freedom 5 provided uh, access gateways and they were also uh, hosting the orchestrator. And for the management, uh, in their case, uh, it was using the, the OMC, Nagios, and for their uh, billings uh, and, and CRM, they, had, they were using open source suite CRM. Um, from there, it's a very developer friendly, um, developed uh, uh, basically, uh, we called it an AP uh, module within there that does API calls to Nagios. Uh, so all of the actual radio information is inputted into the CRM. Um, that gets uh, an API called to Nagios, which creates all of the different hosts that are being monitored. So as far as the typical site, um, this is this is uh, kind of the, the standard that is being used for the majority uh, of sites, depending on user count. So um, this was the most uh, economical uh, route found uh, as far as trying to provide uh, 360 coverage as much as possible. Uh, initially, they were using, um, before the, the project here, they were using Omni antennas, but the performance just wasn't there. So we ended up using uh, two uh, 120 degree sectors. Um, and while it might not sound like it's 360 coverage, when you look at the, the plots from the antenna vendor, you can see that, you know, with the exception of the you know, the very edges here um, in between the sectors. Um, it is, you know, it might not have the same coverage there, but it, it, it you know, it is still for the most part, three, 360 degrees here. We call this the butterfly configuration. So for each site, we would have one, uh, you know, B um, and, and, you know, to specify on this. So that we, on the Eno B, this is uh, just one unit. Um, it's the RU and BBU all in one. So it's just a small cell radio. So you have one radio installed, um, you connect it to two, uh, in this case, KP performance antennas. Um, it's a four port radio. So you'd have two um, cables running uh, to each separate antenna. Um, and then it's uh, set up in dual carrier mode. So each uh, sector would have its own independent cell. And then of course the Megma access gateway would be installed at the tower site as well. Okay, uh, this is just a 
a kind of high level, like if, you know, what its uh, network setup is for each site for the most part. Um, this is a, a more generic uh, IP uh, configuration here. But um, in a sense, uh, the, the access gateway, um, you'll have the two ports here. One is uh, northbound that goes towards the orchestrator, one southbound toward the you know, B network. Um, so you have on the northbound side, you'll have your management IP. Um, and then in this case, we set up two APNs to split the traffic. Uh, one is for the internet traffic for the user, uh, just general internet, and then one's for management. So the management uh, is necessary to allow connectivity uh, from the NOC to be able to access the CPEs. Um, so, you know, this is what's with fixed wireless. It is a little bit different with a uh, typical mobile network. With fixed wireless, the, the difference with the UE side is that the operator owns the UE. So they need to be able to monitor, get any kind of alerts if there's degradation of signals, disconnects and so forth. So we do need a separate uh, um, network to be able to management, manage those radios. So in this case, we have uh, the two APNs. So this is a pretty, general setup that most WIS will, will be using. There could be other APNs, maybe you split up you know, your phone and, and other SIP services, uh, for example, but the, in, in general, you'll have the two APNs here. Um, but the, the big benefit uh, with the bridging support now is that the actual router behind the CPE can just do a simple DHCP request and be able to get a DHCP assigned from an external DHCP server. So this the behavior is actually very similar now or the same uh, as to what someone would expect if they were just to throw up, say, a, a simple bridged uh, Wi-Fi AP. So, um, you know, that removes the complexity for sure because we don't have to worry about having a separate uh, configuration for the network and how do we, you know, design the network around that. So so all those pieces got got removed with the with this MIGMA setup. So, so this has made the deployment uh, much easier. Um, another topic uh, that I think is important to discuss as well is uh, it's important to know what are the economics that, uh, you know, that a WISP is looking at when they're deploying sites. Uh, the majority of WISPs are self-funded, um, so they do need to pay attention very closely to the ROI for each site that's being deployed. Um, and, uh, you know, considering that the majority is going to be pretty rural, um, you know, with a low user count, keeping the cost down is quite important. Um, you know, so this is just pretty general. There, there's a lot of ancillaries and, and, and other things that are not being accounted here. Um, you know, as noted, there's there's a number of overheads and engineering services is not part of this as well. But this gives you kind of an idea of, you know, per site that's being deployed, what are the different costs we're looking at? Um, and this is just from the LTE point of view. Now, these costs could be brought down further. There's different base station options, for example. Um, you know, there's radios down to as low as the sub $1,000. Um, you know, if, if you're looking for, uh, there's like a PoE powered, we call it Nova 227. Um, there's just single carrier um, radios that are uh, at a lower pro you know, cost point. So, so there are ways to bring this down. The backhaul pricing could also be brought down a bit too if needed, but um, this, you know, overall this gives uh, some general uh, pricing and this is all list, right? So the actual cost, this is US pricing, list pricing. So the actual cost that the operator would spend is likely gonna be less than this as well. But again, this is quite high level of what we're looking at. So looking at those costs from the previous slide, um, you know, we can try to try to estimate what is the, the ROI that we're looking at here. Um, so, you know, for 25 subscribers, which, you know, would probably be an average site, but, you know, it could still be less than that. Um, what we're trying to achieve, the first thing that you look, that an operator is going to look at is, you know, what can they use that's already existing? Um, in Wisconsin, there's lots of, lots of farmland. There's, there's generally some farm <laughs> silo, uh, and so forth that, that could be used. Um, that's, that's, you know, probably 80% plus of the sites. So um, that's gonna be the first uh, you know, option that we look for. Uh, and in this case, we can see that even with 25 users, the, the general thing that an operator is gonna look at is trying to get ROI around one year or less. So that is, you know, for the most part achievable, um, you know, if you have you know, only a, a 25 user count, um, 
But when we look at, you know, what if there's an existing tower? What if we rent that? What if we build our own tower? Um, you could see the ROI really gets up there. And at that point, it's, you know, the economics maybe don't work out quite as well. Um, but if we bring out, if you have a more, you know, somewhat more dense uh, uh, subscriber base, you know, that's where the, the tower rent, uh, build a new tower, those can start to make more sense. But, you know, depending again on the number of users, um, you know, that's going to dictate the ROI and, and potentially what direction we go. Okay, um, so the rest of the, the slides here kind of just uh, overview quickly what the process, high level what the process is to onboard uh, the equipment, you know, the products here, um, starting with the, the Magma. So um, for anyone to get started, to, to deploy the orchestrator is, is gonna be your step one. Um, obviously you can go to GitHub, you can work, get the, the procedures for deploying one. Um, in our case, uh, for Y Connect, Migma was being used, uh, so they just set up uh, and managed that by themselves. Uh, and then, as far as once you get that set up, so you would log into a brand new Mega uh, Orchestrator. You would simply create a uh, set up a name, um, and then the process that's laid out is going to be what follows that Y Connect used. So for Y Connect, the IP allocation was set to DHP broadcast. That's what enables the, the bridging um, and then enabling multiple APN um, and then setting your, your typical um, PLMN information. And then for configuring the, the RAN settings, one thing that might be confusing at first glance with Migma is that there is RAN parameters and configuration within the, the web UI, which um, the reasoning, uh, I think, prior was uh, that the Magma would actually uh, redirect the DNS uh, for the TR69 and actually kind of take control of the, the, the parameters as far as setting those up. So the Magma does have the ability uh, to actually do all of your RAN configuration within, uh, within the Magma uh, UI as well. Within, but uh, in the case of Y Connect, we did not follow that. We kind of just you know, you can still program the RAN settings, but uh, in Y Connect's case, we did not use that. Um, so once you have your orchestrator set up, this is more looking at the HSS point of view. Uh, the next thing you'll do is you will create uh, all your APNs. So in the case, there's two APNs set up. Um, it's a pretty simple process. You just set up your APN name. You give your, your AMBER configuration, essentially what's the default uh, rate limit you want for that. Um, and then we use management and internet. Um, after that, you would import your subscribers. So this is all your SIM card data. Um, if you're migrating from Cloud Core, you could just you know, export that data and then import that uh, right into Magma. Um, and then for Magma, there's the option of manually adding the, the SIM cards one by one or using the import method. Uh, for the gateways itself, uh, so this is, uh, in Yconnect's case, one gateway was being deployed at each tower site. Um, you know, you could easily test it by just putting it on any commodity hardware, um, you know, using the GitHub uh, link here. Uh, for Freedom Fi, they do provide uh, some, some gateways um, and that's the easier route. And again, that's what Yconnect was using. Uh, so yeah, again, you know, we just deployed one Freedom Fi uh, per, per tower site. Um, and those were already kind of pre-programmed and designed to be zero touch. So just simply deploy it and then, um, you know, connect it to the network. Um, and then the only really manual thing that we were doing is configuring port forwarding, which was allowing uh, access to the ENOB. B. So once you've deployed the actual gateway, um, there's really only a couple steps you need to take from the orchestrator. So you would log in, you would create the gateway, um, you know, we set the NAT being disabled was one setting, and then you would assign the, the, the different APNs which would be associated with that gateway. Um, and then for the management VLANs, uh, there is no web parameters that you can set at this moment. So you would just edit the JSON. It's, um, it, it's not too difficult, but uh, in our case, we would add the SGI management uh, interface VLAN information here. Um, this was uh, for the management VLAN. 
So once you have your the orchestrator has been set up, you've added uh, an access gateway. The next thing is configuring the email B to utilize, you know, to point to the new network. So um, there's really actually four steps really needed to make that happen. Um, so one, uh, we would set the uh, WAN to be DHCP since the access gateway was assigning the, I, the IPs directly to the email B. Uh, and then we increase the MTU. This is to allow the additional overhead. Um, and then the next was the MME pool and IPsec. So by default within advice as B, these will be enabled because it's pointing to the cloud EPC out of the box. So you would just disable the MME pool and IPsec. You would disable the LGW. LGW is the local gateway. It's a LIPA local breakout type function. Um, so out of the box with the BISL ZNLB, it will connect to the cloud EPC, but the actual user plane would reroute to the ENLB itself. Um, but for the purpose uh, of Magma, and once you, you know, go to uh, kind of a third party EPC, you will want to make sure that's disabled. So all the user plane traffic is sent to Magma as well. And then lastly, you would just simply program the MME IP. Um, and then if the PLMN is changed, you would set that up as well. So you would save, reboot, and at that point, the ENOB is done. And this can all be done straight from the ENOB web GUI. From orchestrator, at that point, uh, we just add the ENOB. Um, we set, make sure that the external managed is enabled. That way that uh, it can, um, reach out to the OMC that there's no there's no DNS hijacking taking place and rerouting it to the you know be DE service and uh, then uh, attach the you know be to the gateway uh, this is all done within the orchestrator so you basically set a relationship um, of the you know be to which gateway you're using um, and yeah really that's uh, about it from that point of view and lastly, the, the CPE, uh, it's pretty simple. You would just insert the SIM card. Um, of course, make sure the SIM card is already provisioned in the orchestrator. You would access the, the CPE web interface and program it to be one, disable the built-in DHCP server. So it's not assigning a DHCP on the LAN interface. Uh, you would set it to bridge mode and then you would configure your two APNs. Um, at that point, the CPE should be getting an IP address from the external DHCP uh, server uh, on the tower network. Oh. Um, this is just a quick screenshot uh, from Nagios. Uh, so these, so for, for Nagios integration, all we really did is make sure that we added the different SMP checks for each OID. Um, and then we made sure to add link, add to create the services and then link them to the different hosts. Um, these host names are basically for the uh, Suite CRM. The Suite CRM, when you're adding the different, uh, you know, these, you would set which, you know, which uh, host group they belong to, and then the API calls will automatically create the host and, and link it. So from the Nagios web interface, it would show, you know, something like this, where it shows all the different metrics that we're trying to monitor. So this was the kind of the last piece of the project that we wanted to do is make sure that their third party NMS was also monitoring the equipment. Okay, um, yeah, I guess uh, that's about it.